Greta Lipsky from Sunny Meadows and Heidi from Field and Forest. Both of these farms have great stories of expansion, of creating new systems to make things easier for them, to bring in more money, to work smarter, not harder. So what's going to happen in this talk, I'm pretty much just here to introduce them and to moderate. We're going to have about 25 minutes. Let's all be quiet, please. We're going to have about 25 minutes for Steve and Gretel to present on their farm, and then we're going to switch over to Heidi to talk about her farm. They're both going to do a little introduction on their farm, a kind of a snapshot of where they are now versus where they used to be. And then they're each going to talk about something that's gone really well for them as they've expanded, something that hasn't gone so well, because that's always helpful to hear also. And then some of their biggest lessons learned as they've grown their operations. So let's, let's put our hands together for these guys. So we're going to stand and talk because I'm in the way. right here there's yeah. about yeah in the greenhouses that's our house in the barn um it's about an acre and a half that's in tillable and then this is a rented plot over here which is two and a half acres tillable so each one of these plots over here is is a half acre um, and then this year we expanded to a place that's about 10 minutes down the road uh, so we reached out we were looking for places to either rent or by the place that we rent that's adjacent to our property, we have no contract, and so we got a little scared because we had a farmer talk about how they had a contract and the farmer passed away and then they got kicked off their land, and so we kind of had like a oh no moment <laughs> this winter. So we um, weren't able to like really afford anything in our area, and so we reached out to people in the industry around us and said, you know, sometimes we know that land is passed down through families and probably going on the market. Um, if you're like, no, of anything, we're looking for land to expand our production. Um, and the guy from Decker's Nursery responded and said, you know, I remember being young and land poor. I'm like, I would love to help you guys out. I have about eight acres that you guys can rent. Um, so just like being, going out there and kind of like taking that risk of asking people would really pay it off. So now we have a five-year contract with him. Um, it's about 10 minutes down the road, so then this year I was just trying to figure out how to be in two places at one time. <laughs> um, so getting the flowers back and the people there and um, all the logistical stuff. The nice thing about it was um, that we had already set up our farm and learned what we liked and didn't like about our farm so we could kind of start a new farm over there. Uh, set it up the way we thought was the most efficient way to run beds and everything like that, so it's really worked out. So our stats, this is our 10th year in business. We have 15 employees um, this year. These are kind of our, our acres. We've got a total of six acres in annual production, four acres in cover crop. So part of the idea with the expansion was to be able to rest some of the home farm land um, that we've been working so hard. So this is the most we've ever been able to like play with cover crops and resting areas and kind of like long-term bed prep. Um, so where the values are gonna go next year with the there's radishes there right now, and it was cover crop all summer, so we're pretty excited about kind of long-term soil health that we'll be able to implement now. We were growing really intensively on those three acres, uh, multi-planting every bed pretty much, and not really getting a chance to rest stuff. So kind of as soon as this all started to happen, there was a weight lifted off my shoulders for space, uh, which really, really helped out. So we do move mechanically cultivate, which if you read growing for market, I just wrote an article about mechanically cultivating versus like using plastic. Um, and we've got nine greenhouses, half of which are heated. Some of them we produce in the ground and other ones are space for trays or crates and things like that that we can't plant in the ground. So we kind of have a mixed like package, but we zone 
26A, so we have flowers from March through about Thanksgiving, and then we do Christmas wreaths, or like our last like hurrah um, before the end of the season. And then this year we had orchids for the first time in January, February, so it was the first time we had flowers for Valentine's Day. Cymbidium orchids. Um, our sales outlets, 3086 grocery stores, 22% florist. Um, we started shipping through the books, um, and that became 7% of our income this year. Yeah, so it was a pretty big account. And then 50% weddings, um, we sell to high tubers, we farmer's market, so kind of our whole like mixed bag of everything. Um, and what we found is that it helps to diversify, so that way if you know, the farmer's market is rainy or we live in a college football town, like it's nice because if the farmer's markets go down, then something else kind of makes up for it. So we found with the different sales outlets, um, it's really worked for us. So a typical week at um, Sunny Meadows is uh, on Mondays we harvest for our Tuesday grocery store deliveries. Um, on Tuesdays we go to our local grocery stores and then one distributor um, about an hour and a half north of us. Um, so then... On Tuesday we're harvesting for Wednesday florist deliveries. On Wednesday we're harvesting for Thursday deliveries to a distribution center grocery. Um, and then on Thursday we're harvesting for Friday local store deliveries. So every day, and then Friday for Saturday market. So every day there's turnover of you know, what we harvest is going out the next day. So we're doing a lot of harvesting and processing yeah. uh, every Six days a week we harvest. So this is a grocery store bouquets that that go out. Okay. <laughs> so this is our this is a stack lines growth comparison. So what this is is that because you know your income and like the acres you produce on are so far apart on the graph, you can put them together on a stack lines thing so that you can see how the trends like fit together. Um, so I was like, this is the first time I was like excited about Excel. <laughs> yeah, look at that tree that I created. Um, so what you're seeing here is acres in production and then the years across the bottom. So this is our 10th year. We went from 0.5 acres to one and a half to two to three to three and a half. And then this year to six, about six and a half acres in production. Um, so that's the bottom line. So it doesn't really, because there's so much growth here, it doesn't really, you don't see a whole lot at the bottom. But, um, but the point is, we started at half an acre, and then went to an acre and a half, and did an acre and a half for a year, and then, you know, it was a slow process to getting to where we were. Yeah. So the other things that are on this graph are gross sales and employees, which are actually this middle line here. So gross sales and the number of employees increased at the same rate. Like that's the exact same line. That's why it looks like you can't even see it. Um, so you know, starting with like ten thousand dollars and then working up to, you can see I plotted on here the 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 most important turning points of our farm. Year five was our first year with employees, um, and you can see the significant increase uh, like in sales and like profit per acre. So this line here, the top line, is the, is, is the gross sales per acre. Um, so you can see that increasing as the employees are increasing. And then in year seven was our first year without vegetables, which we're gonna talk about. But um, So again, you can see the significant increase, like you know, focusing our energy, dropping vegetables, bringing people on. Those were two big like moments. For, for the farm. But as far as this chart goes, last year the, the money per acre we did when we were at three and a half acres was by far our best year. Um, but I feel confident that we can match that once we get more settled in with this expansion. Yeah. And but, some of the stuff we were planting pretty intensely previously, so some things are being double planted, you know, to like fit in with our space. So we're actually this winter going to calculate like, okay, we were on three and a half acres, but if there were some things that are being double planted, really we were planting more than that to figure out how much we actually increase. Sorry, would you mind just sharing some of those numbers for those that can't see the chart from here? Yeah. Um, so the gross sales went from? From year one. 10,000. On year one, right? On year one. 
to 25,000 to 35,000 to 45,000. So our record keeping was not as good. It was like shoe boxes of receipts back then. So I couldn't pull the like the actual numbers, but it was somewhere around there. Um, and then to 92,168,288. 320, 355, and then 444. So this is this is our gross sales so far this year. I think we're going to take questions at the end, if that's okay. That way we can make sure we can get through this, and then we'll have time for a lot of questions. Um, so I know that that's a lot, and it's kind of like I don't know how it, it makes you feel. Um, <laughs> but I, I do want everyone to understand, like we aren't like. We're just really into this, you know. It's, we're not special. Like we didn't go to school. I, we're not really pencil pushers, or we're horrible at math, you know. Like this is possible for you guys too if you're dedicated or willing to put in this energy. Um, Dave said to someone last year, Stephen Gretel can do it. You can do it too, you know. <laughs> But I want you to be encouraged by it. And no, not everybody wants to get to that point, but. Um, we think it's a lot of fun, you know, so that's yeah. what motivates us. Um, okay, I'm going to try and move faster so that I can talk to you. Okay, a few things that worked out really well for us. One was standardization. So efficiencies, systems, we talked about planning yesterday, spacing, bed length, like irrigation, just having systems that were scalable. So figuring out, you know, how many plants, how many rows per bed, um, because we mechanically cultivate, everything is four row. And so the other thing that worked out really well for us, this is the standardization, the four rows. So we mark everything with this cedar, or now we've got um, clamps on the back of the tiller that mark the rows. So everything is set to the spacing at the farm. It's either four row, or there's some things that are two row, but they're all on the spacing. And then the spacing is varied in between the plants, whether it's every three inches, every six inches, every 12 inches. Some things are double seeded, just depending on the crops. Um, but this allowed us to mechanize. We're supposed to be the next slide. But, um, so this is uh, the like planting, the net that you use. We use that as a grid. So that's what we use for the every six inches, 12 inches. So you're planting in those furrows that are marked by the cedar, but then every six inches or 12 inches, depending on the crop. And this makes um, hoeing, not only cultivation, but hand hoeing way easier if everything spaced the same. You have the same size hoe you use, you know how to zig and zag it is. <laughs> and the other thing that worked out really well for us was mechanization. So our old weed control method was by hand or with wheel hose. And um, as a farm crew, we knew that that was not a sustainable model. Um, we had one summer a college kid that pretty much that's all he did was wheel hoe. Um, and then we were like, we got to do something different. So we started mechanically cultivating. So we've got a few farm off tractors. Um, this one, you can see the tire track cultivator on the back of it. And it goes in those four rows and, and weeds for us. Um, and then we just go back and weed in row. So they are baskets and hoes. Those are also pretty important tools. Yeah. So the basket weeder can actually get closer than the cultivating sweeps can. Um, so this is the step, like the plants get planted, then we use the basket weeder, then we use the cultivating sweeps. And then by that time, hopefully the plants are big enough that they shave the weeds off. So we're trying to get into a habit of hoeing preventatively, pretty much um, at least the crops that we know or if we have trouble with weeds. So we're going there like two weeks after we plant and just hoe it. Um, it's way faster than having to hand weed it later. Okay, so the biggest lessons we've learned, that you're a lot stronger than you thought you were. So farming leaves learning new things, problem solving, working through the tough times, growing with your business, and conquering your fears. So it's not for the light at heart. <laughs> um, you know, and there's something like we didn't get to yesterday in our talk, but people ask us a lot, being a married couple and working together, I mean, it definitely, like, forces you to communicate more than you ever have and be honest with each other and, you know, really talk through things that it's easy to just, like, push it aside and work even harder, but if you don't address the issue, then it's just going to build up to something. So, you know, there's times when if we're having a tough time, it's like, well, 
just go out to dinner and just like get off the farm and have a drink and like talk about stuff because sometimes just like leaving the compound is what <laughs> what what the brain needs just to kind of reset and think of it more from an outside point of view instead of just like being in it. Um, so and we've tried to also schedule meetings like you know we have a morning meeting the two of us every morning. Because there's times now with multiple employees that, like, you know, we're not necessarily working together all the time, or he's managing stuff and I'm managing stuff. Um, so, but it's definitely possible, and there's definitely still tough time. I mean, it's been 10 years, and I always say, like, it's like we've been married for 20 years, we've been married for eight, because if you think about the actual amount of time that someone <laughs> is together that works a nine to five, like, this has been, you know, it's accelerated for sure. <laughs> Um, but it's definitely possible. And the other lesson that we've learned is to invest in the business because it's worth it. So farming is a lifestyle, you're not going to get rich, so you might as well make your life more comfortable. So quality of life investments for us have been a really important step in what we're doing. So employees being one of them. So investing in people, investing in equipment, these are the farm walls that we use to cultivate. This is at the farm tour we had this year. This is more equipment. This is a cedar. This Up until big. this year, we just used a garden hose and a single sprinkler, and I had like three of them that I could move around the field. So, so this, this, is the, this is the irrigation system that we have now at the new farm. This is the cedar that we use at the new farm. So we realized nobody's going to want to walk 400 foot rows with the cedar, so, so we bought this cedar, which has been really great. This is the time leader that we use here in one of the farm walls. And season extension is the other investment that we found really worked for us. So it means we can bring people on sooner, it means there's not as much of a crunch in the summer months um, to make the money because you can and you can hit Mother's Day. So this is this is pre Mother's Day cut. Um, so that's really important for us. We can have the tulips and a few things for Easter, but Mother's Day is really the biggest floral holiday that we can hit. Um, and so season extension is a big part of what we do. Yeah. So this is the home farm. The 150 foot rows is the longest row that we have there. And then this is the new farm, 400 foot rows. So we put everything, uh, everything that was like the summer, easier annual stuff over at the other farm. Anything that's particular, Ami, Rebecca, Yara, like stuff that needs harvested earlier, is had needs special care, dahlias and stuff like that are all at the other <coughs> farm. And then the summer stuff is there. So this year we. You know, with the volume, there were some things that got a little weedier than they had been. But, so we just tell people when you're harvesting, try not to look down the full row. Just concentrate on what's in front of you. If you look all the way down, you can be like, that's a lot of flowers <laughs> And then this is the expediter for when we need the hays. And then future investments for us, probably more greenhouses and woody perennials. So our goal is to turn some of the home farm into more of that, um, have more of the annual production over at the other farm. Ta -da. <laughs> All right. so we're going to switch over to Heidi's presentation right now. Thank you guys. Um, so we started a little late, we're going to run a few minutes late, which means you guys are going to have lots of time for questions and answers for everyone at the end, and then maybe these guys can share something that didn't work for them so well also. I know we're always pressed for time up here. Yeah. But Heidi's working with a really different model, I'm sure a lot of you guys follow her and her business and her business partner Molly, um, running a thriving design business out of Chicago and then just expanded onto a lot of new land way outside of town. So Heidi's going to give her talk. We'll have time for questions for everyone at the end, and we're like, just giving the time for the. Great. Hi everyone. Thanks so much for having me here. It's awesome to be here. Four years ago was my first ASCFG conference, and my mind was totally blown. So I'm 
equally mind-blown that I'm here talking to you today. Um, it's been kind of a whirlwind the uh, past five years, to be honest with you. We've been at three different sites in five years. Um, and I'm kind of going to go through the steps of why and how that happened for us. Um, so I had a background in vegetable production for seven years and took the switch into flowers in 2012 and been doing that since then. So I live in Chicago where our design business is Chicago based and um, we had been growing in the city and then outside the city uh, for florists mostly and then most recently we moved to a larger site which we'll show you um, a few slides. So we've been adapting our model and our systems and our strategies every year. I mean nothing is ever the same. So as you know, it's an extremely dynamic field to be in. It's never boring. Um, so here is the very first site. This is uh, actually owned by the Cook County uh, Prison. So just uh, on the other side of that fence, there's a, there was kind of boot camp inmates doing their chants and drills. Um, and this site was managed by the Botanic Garden, who I was working for at the time. And they kind of knew I had like a budding interest in flowers and were like, you know, go ahead and try it if you if you want to, you can see if you can grow flowers. I was like, yeah, okay. So these were telephone poles, um, raised beds, and was growing in straight compost. That's they dumped it there, and that's why it died. So that year, while I was working full time, um, I just had this little thousand square foot plot, and I decided to do a flower share just to get the word out about the flowers and maybe just test the market. Um, I think it's really important before you quit your day job or you know, before you really launch and dive yourself into this to make sure there is a market, make sure you enjoy it. Um, and I absolutely did. I did a lot of uh, friends of friends weddings that year, maybe 11 or so. And so, you know, there was basically, it was enough for me to quit the job and um, I just started talking to people. I need land, like, I would say that's my, my biggest piece of advice if you don't have the means to buy property. Um, don't be afraid to talk to people. I strongly believe that when you put it out in the world and talk to people about what you want to do, opportunities will come to you. Um, that's happened with every single site that I've been on. So this was a half an acre outside Chicago um, in, a in the Barrington suburb. And that year, um, I had a lot of luck with dahlias and decided to really start focusing on that more. Um, because they don't ship well, I was doing really well with those in the Chicago market. Um, so I started selling to florists wholesale, um, and then gradually was increasing more of the wedding and design work. So most of this was self-taught. Um, I really just enjoyed making things, and I'd always have. So it came pretty naturally. I did take a few workshops to get some chops as, you know, as far as processing and conditioning of stems. Um, so from the beginning, you know, farming was the reason that I started Field and Florist because I wanted to see high quality products come into uh, the Chicago market and I wanted to work with it myself. Um, I don't think I would be designing if I wasn't also growing because that's the part that makes it really interesting. Someone talked uh, recently about you know, the novelty of being a grower and designer um, and having that you know, control over your product. I can use my stems in all kinds of stages they're in, not just the you know, really basic stage that you find it at the wholesaler with tall straight stems. I like to do all the weird stuff and have lots of textures and interesting varieties to incorporate. Um, so this was growing. This was this site was really important and integral. Even though it's only half an acre, it showed me that um, there was a growing market for what I was doing, and it there was a, there was minimal risk here. So this was owned by a friend. And he also had a cafe that I started doing weekly accounts in. I would bring flowers there and do pop-ups on the weekends. The word was getting out. And that was, it was basically free to me to do that. So I took all those opportunities and pretty much said yes to a lot of things, which I wouldn't do now. But at the time, it was really important to get the word out. And I went, I went nuts doing that. Um, so the flower share grew to 30 people. I was a little bit more begrudgingly doing it because I realized it was still a lot of work, hand designing all those bouquets um, for not that much money. Um, but it was still a good way to get the word out. And sometimes those things are valuable, even if you know it's not in terms of money, it's you know the story. 
Um, so you can see here's the, the site in the early years, <laughs> first getting tilled up. Uh, we didn't have any equipment, so I went to a rental center. I was like, you guys got a tiller, like a big one? And I rented that tractor here, and it had a, a nice tiller, and we tilled up that giant suburban lawn, basically. And then I dumped a semi's worth of compost there and tilled that in. And the dahlias really loved it. Um, we did really well with those. <clears throat> and uh, really kind of kept on doing that um, as, as one of our main crops. So the weddings were increasing. Um, we started to, I don't know, people just started hearing about us. Uh, we didn't really do much advertising, but it focused on having nice photos for our work to represent what we were doing. Um, and then the florist wholesale list kept growing. Um, that year, I met Molly, my business partner, uh, that was a game changer. I realized I was way out of my league trying to do all the florists' orders and the weddings, and I couldn't keep track of it all. My email inbox was like stacked, and you know it wasn't providing the kind of customer service I wanted to. So we began sharing all those tasks. Um, she kind of started managing the wholesale orders, and we shared the wedding work. Um, that year, we purchased a VCS tiller, best little machine, and just kind of kept kept going with the design work. Um, and I, I think, you know, like I said, that I wouldn't be doing the design if it wasn't for the farming. Um, we don't use entirely all of our own flowers, though we try to grow, you know, as much we can as much as we can for what we like to use. But I found myself feeling like my designs were getting a bit stunted if I wasn't able to get the you know additional product that I needed. So we use a lot of growers around the region as well, um, sourcing from them as well as um, the West Coast. Our wholesaler knows we you know, ask a lot of questions about sourcing. Uh, they probably are annoyed with us, but you know, I think it's important uh, to let them know that there are consumers who are interested in using American grown flowers and to keep you know, pushing that and telling them that our customers care about that. And so you know, it encourages them to really ask more questions to their buyers about where these things are coming from. So last year, 2014, we did 40 weddings and events, had 40 florists we were selling to. We cut the flower share, it was kind of a pain. Um, and then this past year, you know, increasing the events and the wedding work, we did 50 last year, kind of really <laughs> pushed our limits. Um, and then our, our florist wholesale availability is going up to 60 people. Um, not everyone was buying. It was oftentimes maybe half of that who were consistently buying, maybe 20 florists. Um, but you know, all those accounts, they were turning out to be like the bread and butter of the business. So those florists who are agreeing to get two, three hundred dollars a week, four hundred dollars, whatever you have that looks good, those are like my favorite people. Um, so those really kept us going and, and allowed us to continue to buy, you know, plant material and to keep, keep growing. Um, but we were kind of at a capacity with that half acre. So we had to start saying no to a lot of people, which is terrible. Uh, when, especially when you know what you can do. Um, at this point, we had been on the site for three years and felt like, I think we can take it to the next level. Um, so Molly and I started looking around um, to buy land, but we couldn't really afford to have the kind of property that had the most bay and farm, but also had like a nice enough house that wasn't gonna like fall apart and it was like mold death. <laughs> so uh, this kind of property was really hard to find. Uh, and we, you know, like we do, just kept telling people what we wanted. This is what we're looking for, if you know anybody. Um, I mean, it was really important to be within two hours of the city, um, because we both live in the city. Um, it's kind of an interesting model, because we're, um, we don't commute back and forth every day, but we're spending two, three, sometimes four days at a time, uh, when there's a lot of work to do, at the farm, and going back. And, you know, my husband doesn't do this work, so I go back and, you know, live kind of a cleaner life and have a nice drink and get some good coffee. But, you know, going back to the farm and having that, that you know, best of both worlds has really been a quality of life, um, kind of awesome balance for me. Even though it sounds a bit nuts, um, it, it, it really works uh, for me. So, um, here's some of the early days sorting orders, mollies in the grass, like, you know, this is like low tech kind of. When you start out, you make it work. We have no cooler on site. There's no, you know, fancy ways of storing or organizing things. But this worked for us, and it worked for the forest. And we got good product to them. The same day it was cut. 
So we couldn't, because we couldn't store it, delivering the same day was what we had to do. Um, and we worked some super long days and got really tired. Um, but it was all the more impetus to keep us going to look for that better site and that situation that was even more sustainable. So this is something we never would have guessed would have come our way. Um, but this uh, landowner who has 30 acres in Southwest Michigan and Three Oaks, just about an hour and a half south of here, we got connected to him through a friend of a friend by talking about what we wanted to do in a bar. He knew a guy he went to culinary school with, and he knew a guy. <laughs> and then two days later, I was meeting this guy for a walkthrough of the site. And so what this site is, um, is a foreclosed upon nursery uh, that had been sitting vacant for 15 years. Yeah. And so, I mean, the amount of infrastructure was really mind blowing. Um, all these down here, this is a head house. It's about, I don't know, a couple hundred feet long. And off of that are 144 by 33 foot wide tunnels. It's all steel frames that are still really good, um, but they need new poly, new hardware, and all that. Um, and then there's these 15 foot wide by 144, and there's eight of those. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't even have a way to start seeds before. I had to buy all my plugs. I had, you know, no infrastructure at all. So the learning curve is extremely tremendous here. Um, <laughs> I'm like, oh, you know, page long of questions for half the people in this room still. You know, it's like, so tunnel, tunnel growing um, is new to us this year. Uh, this area here, zone A, this is an acre and a half that we fenced in with a 10 foot deer fence. So we're doing all of our annuals, um, pit of perennials in there, and the dahlias. But um, that was you know, still four times more than what we have last year. Um, I have to say, even though, you know, even if you do expand your production, triple or quadruple, uh, we couldn't put entirely this whole thing in production because we wanted to save a good amount for perennials. We couldn't just dump, you know, thousands of the high-end clematis we wanted to yet. But, um, you know, even if you do expand in, in this way, unless you have a dedicated market that's extremely planned out, you know, you're going to have a loss. Like, I estimated we probably um, lost about $10,000 in just lost products sitting in the field because we didn't have another, you know, a secondary market to sell it to. So our florists really upped the ante. They stayed with us. They bought more from us. Um, but what we learned was that we really need uh, a second harvest day. So because our model is basically half of our work is design work and half is farming, um, half the week Molly and I were like out of there and going to process flowers and, you know, go to our studio and do these, 300 people person wedding. So we weren't at the farm every day to, you know, really invest full time in growing it. So that was that's a challenge. Um, but what we did this past year was invest in a full time farm manager who um, someone who had a lot of experience in vegetable farming and has worked with us last season part time. Uh, so the day to day, the har you know, following through with the crop plan and the harvest and maintenance schedule, having that person we could rely on, water the seedlings when we weren't there was 